Welcome to Stories, Wisdom, and Recipes. I'm Lawrence Pugliese, your host. And on this installment, we have at the table and at the theremin, theremin extraordinaire, thereminist, would be thereminist? Thereminist. Thereminist extraordinaire, Jason Smelzer. Take it away, Jason. Beautiful, Jason. Beautiful. How about you come over to the table and we'll talk a bit about you and the theremin. Ladies and gentlemen, a nice round of applause there at your homes for Jason Smeltzer. Thank you, sir, for being on the program. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you know, how many times have we seen each other out at breakfast or to lunch or what have you? And say, we have to get you on the program. It, it never ends, but here we are. <laughs> here we are, finally. And, uh, before we get started, let's let's share with the folks where where you're from. Are you from uh, anywhere in particular? Um, a lot of Scranton. A lot of Scranton. Grew up on a farm about an hour away. A um, lot of time. A lot of you know growing up in a field. So uh, we wind up being a high caliber tinkerer is usually all. That makes sure. sense. But a lot of Scranton. A lot of Scranton. But the early years on a farm, uh, like a dairy farm or. A um, Primarily organic produce, but also uh, a lot of engineering going on on that farm. It's like farm ha has a lot of, like, this would almost make sense on that farm. Oh, if wow. that's if so that a lot of creative sense. individuals, a lot of uh, engineering minds. And a lot of one off. One off. One degree off from. You know, <laughs> from normality? Yeah, something. Yeah, which like is that. good, I think. By farm standard. Yeah. yeah, by farm standards. I like it. I like it. And uh, you've, you've been in uh, the Scranton area for quite some time now. 
uh, working with a lot of artists and musicians over the years. And anything I can get away with is yes. usually how I'm whatever. <laughs> well, I love uh, every time I've ever seen you perform. It's always been breathtaking and and very uh, also compelling. You know how it all works. So tell us a bit. You know, first of all, how you got into it, and then how it works. How did you get into the theremin okay. when you're up on the farm there? Um, well, the theremin is post farm. Post farm. We were graduated from college. Basically. Essentially, had a musical degree, um, among other things, and went into repair. I do a lot of like if a kid, if someone in the Scranton school district or thereabouts drops their trumpet, it probably comes to me to be repaired. Oh, I didn't know that. So I had a musical background, but was not performing for for quite a while, and always had a soft spot for the 20th century troublemakers. And theremin is something you'd run across, and this is going back about 20 years. Um, like you see a little bit more about theremin with YouTube and everything like that, but then you didn't run into it. And I, I had, I was familiar with it, never heard much of anything, but also I had the impression it was a little bit of its, had its day, it was a bit of a dinosaur and didn't really exist anymore. And so it was just online, it's like, what has been done with that and so forth? And the main reason I am a thereminist at all is because 20 years ago, that guy was under $300. Uh, Moog, Bob Moog, who invented synthesis, for lack of better de uh, description, always had a passion for the story. The history of the theremin is unbelievable. Um, but it goes back to the USSR, from what I know. Yeah, it's basically a product of the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, Stalin and Lenin are both in the in the story. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, it's it's not it's not reality. Leon, right? Leon, Leon theremin, yeah. Leon theremin, or some somewhere about that. Um, and that was mainly, it's like, well, let's see what the, like, you, you know, describing it and so forth doesn't really work. So for under $300 and I wasn't performing, I never thought I'd leave the house with it, but, um, locked into it. You, you really do need a musical background to even approach it. It's, there's no mapping it out. That's, that's middle C. <laughs> that's middle <laughs> There it is. That's what you get. There you get. If you go this way, it'll go higher. You go this way, it'll go lower. Um, and it'll change. If, if my music stand moves, I have to retune. Uh, there's even a show wow. once where we, for a subtle change, we dropped a piano lid down and I had to announce to the audience that because of my proximity to the piano being, the piano lid being lowered, that I had to retune. Otherwise, I, and I also wanted to specifically mention that I had to retune to the audience so I wouldn't forget that I had to retune because I wouldn't have been able to play the piece with that change in the environment. Because it is a physical positioning sort of mm. instrument, right? Everything well, helps. Every, if someone walks by, they're, <clears throat> they're helping. It's a little bit of a musical burglar alarm. It, uh, it's volume and it's both, yeah. and frequency. Mm -hmm. and, and you control that. Volume is going this way and articulation is going that way. Articulation, you call yeah. it. Okay. It's just a little more concise than volume. frequency yeah. or what have you. And you were saying when you're not up on top of the theremin, it's at full volume. If, if, if you walk away from that au naturel, I have a few safety devices there to, to prevent that. But basically, this, this one's as primitive as you get, even though it's a Moog, but it's the standard. It doesn't have a standby or an off. It is on. And the closer you are to the articulating antenna, the quieter it is. So the farther away your hand gets or whatever is preventing it is full volume when you walk away. So if you walk by it, it's... And, and uh, the, the frequency part or the articulation, is that what you refer to as the frequency part? No, the fre frequency or pitch. Pitch, pitch. So articulation's volume and pitch. Yeah. That is the opposite, right? The, the closer you get, the pitch the gets... higher, the, the higher the frequency. Right, right. And um, it's about capacitors. For those who are engineering and electronic buffs, mm -hmm. it, it, you're basically the other side of the capacitor. You're, you're, and I'm regurgitating information. Like I understand it well enough to sound like I know what I'm playing. Basically, it's capacitance. Whatever holds capacitance, as it gets closer, gets it more excited. And in the theremin, capacitors are hooked to oscillators, which as they get more excited, oscillate more quickly, thus raising the pitch. Gotcha. And somehow that works for the volume as well. Got you. And this is a precursor, as you mentioned, in a way, to the synthesizer. 
Nineteen, uh, 1920s. Yeah, yeah. No, I was looking it up before. 1928, it was patented mm. by... Uh, RCA, probably. Uh, no, it was Theremin. Mm. Oh, he I did. Think. And, then he, and then he gave rights to RCA. Something like that. If you believe Wikipedia. They, the, the, well, there's one book on the Theremin. It's pretty well sought out. But it, there was, before the Depression, the hope... And Theremin wasn't a great entrepreneur. He struggled quite a bit. Um, the notion... I believe from RCA was to, it was since it's very similar to a radio, basically Theremin was a radio science guy. And essentially they did have a radio that you could be turned into a theremin or a radio or both so you could play along with the radio. And they thought they would have a theremin in every home someday. And it was AM, I think, right? I'm sure yeah. this would still be in the 20s. Yeah, yeah, it had to be AM. Wow. Good times. Yeah, good times. Good times. Not, so we're coming up on 100 years. You know. It just crossed. Uh, yeah. Moog actually came out with a centennial theremin. Oh, wow. I like my cheap one better. Yeah, no, I, like, I like the. I even have one that was found in a dumpster that uh, someone just put in a donation bin. Really? So that's, my, that's my favorite story. There, there was one time where I, I was doing something with a string quartet, and it came up that um, the first violinist actually has a Stradivarius. Wow, um, Stradivarius. So I was joking with them. It's like, I put my $300 theremin next to Stradivarius and got away with it. <laughs> you guys jammed? Yeah, we did. Uh, actually, I did the Lorca with them uh, among it, summertime. It was just like a little summer concert series that I managed to get real into. Uh, summertime. Omio Babino Caro. Puccini. Puccini. You'd know it if you heard it. Yeah, I would. I would. I love Puccini. Yeah, I'll try that for you. You'll recognize it. Well, the first piece that you uh, played, was that improvisation or was mm -hmm. that? Loosely based on a Garcia Lorca lullaby. Okay, great. Spanish theremin. Great. Talking about. Yeah, excellent. Um, now, how many are there, do you think, players, thereminists um, in the that, world? Or, or? That's a good question for Moog, um, even though there are, are other makers, but I think they're still pretty much the... I remember in, in an interview with the factory, maybe for the Centennial, I don't know where I saw it, and they, the interviewer said, like they said how many they sell, and it's kind of astonishing considering you don't see them. And the interviewer said, so are there like that many people out there like playing theremin? And they emphatically said no. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's, uh, there are many reasons why you don't see them. I say It's not a realistic instrument. Uh, and I, with me mentioning that I had a musical background, basically you need a musical background and then you throw it away and then you apply all that ability to, to this strange noisemaker. And I just happen to be in a position to do it. How um, does the musical background help? For me and, and probably most, it's vocal training is your nearest equivalent. Like when I'm playing that, I have solfege cascading through my head. It's literally do, re, mi, fa, so, la, di, do, do, so, no, so, no. Uh, and usually, depending on the situation, there again, this is middle C. I don't really know where that is. Uh, if someone gives me a starting pitch and I match it, then I'm fine. If I don't have that, usually when I hear something, then I'll know where I am. I'll hear, I'll literally hear sol, fa, mi, re, do. And then I can proceed from there, depending on the situation. So partly it's ear. It's, it's all ear. You're yeah. reading music. If you are reading music, you're reading music by ear. Understand. Uh, based, uh, uh, another way of describing it, I mentioned to someone, it's, it's like a well-trained voice, the playing of it, except you're taking all your intuition that you have internally and applying it to the end of your fingers, or something like that, like, which is how it feels if you, if you get good at it. So you really like have this strange extra faith that's the equivalent of knowing that you're singing the right note. You know, you don't really know why you have so much confidence in that, but sometimes it's like, that's it. Right. If you're in the moment, it's instinctual. Yeah. It's art in, at that point. And know? mysterious. And it's always good to set yourself up for failure. Oh, that wasn't it, but I'm uh, graceful enough to... <laughs> To adjust. To, yeah, make it sound like a musical idea. Yeah. Usually. And, uh, you know, when, when someone's trying to understand the, the point of the theremin, you know, some folks might say, well, you have synthesizers now mm -hmm. that could probably mimic most of what the theremin, the sounds mm -hmm. at least, the theremin makes. 
what would you say to that? Is it, is it th- does a synth make a synthesizer make this superfluous, mm-hmm. or does I wish the theremin have something <laughs> special? It, it definitely has a high fail rate, which for I would argue for any art is important. Uh, you really need foolish amounts of discipline and faith and, and not even knowing where you're going. Like I, there again, I never thought I'd leave the house with it. Like that wasn't my intention. Uh, initially, I was just fool. I, I bought it as a joke is really kind of what it came down to. And after it did start to make sense to me and it quickly did like, it's like, okay, this is, this, this is, uh, is music. Uh, I made everyone wait three years. Like everyone kind of reeled me out. And I was like, you have to give me three years because there's no way I'm going to be able to concentrate on this thing after I get out there into the real world. So three years, it doesn't leave the house. Uh, and I think it was three years exactly, like it was May. <laughs> Not coming out until May. Uh, a quick funny thing is since I do band and orchestra repair, uh, a conductor in the area reeled me into just a community symphonic, largely brass ensemble thing, uh, which was the most inobvious place to begin doing anything with it. You think it'd be something more like even a jazz or, or any, anything else. Uh, one of my favorite stories is having played the Dalton pig roast the with Dalton. 40 br- brass doing the theme to Star Trek. Uh, Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. That, well, that was one of the questions I was gonna ask you. Uh, it kind of lead me to that uh, coolest gig that you've mm. had. Are you ready? I don't know if you know this one. Yeah, I'm ready. Are you ready? Are you sure? Yeah. Because it's stupid, not right. But uh, to, in 20, 2016, first theremin is to play on the Great Wall of China. Wow, the is Great that, Wall of China. Is that, that's not even a believable platform. It's the Great Wall of China. Long story, but uh, and there's one outlet. <laughs> one outlet on the Great one Wall. One outlet, and you wouldn't want to plug anything you cared about into that. It was just a sealed <laughs> barrier of just arcane electricity that had I'm sure we had to convert yeah you must all have. kinds of things going on there but yeah one fortress down at the base there's, there's one thing that you can a long extension cord oh very long yeah and it was it was like playing in a tornado like the wind that day was un- unbelievable but were there a lot of folks around it was an all-day event it yeah. was a uh, worth telling the story I'll, I'll try to make it quick as possible but uh, along with Spanish theremin uh, I collaborate with uh, a Chinese woman who plays a gujang. And we, she also does acupuncture. So this whole, whole Chinese medical aspect. And she's from the States or she's out? She, she's from Beijing, but she's practically my neighbor. She doesn't live far away. And, and slowly we got to know each other and I managed to reel her. She always seemed up for something, but it took a while to make sense. But she is a, she was an MD and an acupuncturist. And basically invited to a cancer conference, first one in Beijing, she knew the people uh, organizing it. She went to school with the person who organized the Beijing one. So she kind of turned us into the house band. Uh, And also, and from that, it was her dream that we do something on the Great Wall of China, uh, which apparently doesn't happen. Like if you look up music happening on the Great Wall of China, we found one suggestion that maybe the chieftains did something there, and that's it. The chieftains, like it doesn't yeah, the happen. Irish group. Yeah. yeah, which is a little bit random. And the only way she was able to do it is she has a friend. She's, you know, she knows her stuff. She's very well organized. What's she her name? Kathy Wong. We'll have to do something with her at some point. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'm hoping to do a Chinese storytelling thing in next year or so, so we'll keep you posted. Um, she has a friend who has a choir, but he's also from basically Chinese CIA. <laughs> and he got it all put through. Uh, so we had an all day event of music, uh, dance and his choir. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the one that stands that's out. That's the coolest gig. Yeah. And what did Kathy do during that? Like you s- She plays Gujang, uh, sort of a Chinese zither. It, Gujang is basically the equivalent of the, the piano here. It's national instrument. It's similar to a piano, though. Not similar, but it's it's as popular. It's as popular. Yeah. Like okay. if you go to a music store, you'll see Gujang and Pipa and things like that. Like even if someone wanted to look it up, how would you spell that? Do you know off the top mm, of your head? I think it has multiple spellings, but there's a G and a Z and an Ung. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a G, down. a Z and an Ung. Yeah, folks. G, a Z and an Google ung. that. 
the, the equivalent to the piano is that the hotels we stayed at while we were there would have a gujang in the lobby. Like yeah. Does it have a sound that would go nicely with the theremin? Yeah, it, it's surprising how stringed things, even better than piano. Piano, it's a little bit pingy for me to lock in. Electric piano is nice, but like a harp or a classical guitar, or this is like a, it's about, they're about this big. He has, a, I forget the number of strings. I should know that. I think uh, I, might, I might have seen her play out one night. It's very possible. Very possible. Yeah. Yeah, we, we should definitely have both of you guys. Yeah, that would be, we've been meaning to start doing more. We haven't done much since the pandemic. But. And what, what was the, maybe, that was the coolest gig, mm -hmm. the Great Wall of China with uh, Kathy Wong and her CIA friend with the choir. Mm -hmm. What was like the gig where you're just thinking to yourself, boy, should I? Um, are they going to? Is well, this usually, the right? I, usually everything I do with this, it's so precarious. I was, I was, whenever demonstrating, I would say, always set yourself up for failure. It's more interesting if you get through it, if it's not a realistic possibility. So I, I'm very much more often pleasantly surprised how things work. Like, it's like Spanish theremin that I told everybody, that'll be interesting, but it's not going to be good. But it, if you're loose enough, you know, and you get the, the poetry of it, it's, it's believable. That's the word I like to use when it's not an obvious choice, it's to, as opposed to doing science fiction or something like that, doing something that's... Right. Like, the fact that I, like, I can do Elvis and I can, you know... <laughs> well, that's, the, that's a, sort of uh, where I wanted to go in a way. You know, a lot of people would say, yeah, that has an eerie mm -hmm. sort of sound that you would hear associated with the science fiction mm -hmm. uh, milieu, but not necessarily. It's not just that. It, it, it is that mm -hmm. often in films and, and other uh, sorts of projects. You'll, in a theremin, you might hear when it's an eerie, mm -hmm. spooky thing. But you're, you're talking about how it, it brings emotion. Yeah, you, you, you can go there. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to show us in a, in a bit how you could go there. But explain to the folks... I mean, you obviously enjoy the technical aspect of it, mm. but there's the artistic aspect too. If you try to explain to the folks what it gives you. Mm. Well, it's, it is interesting where, uh, compared to m most instruments, even though there's always a certain point where you just are going with what you've developed, like you just try not to think too much. And this one, it's easy to get very self-conscious and you hear everything like this is like from here to here that's about an octave so the expressiveness of it if you have any tension or anything like that i used to be in recordings i used to even be able to hear it's like i'm reading music like you can hear a, a tension because it's just so unforgiving uh, along the lines of playing a spanish piece it's like you can't be stiff in spanish it's it doesn't equate um I'm losing what the question was, though. What it uh, artistically, what it gives to you, what it what is so special about oh. the theremin? Well, it helps that, and this is, would always apply to things I've done. Is that if someone else is doing it, I'm happy with them doing it. So, most things that there's to make it sound silly, it's like there's just less competition. So it's worth putting enormous amounts of extra effort into something where uh, someone else isn't going to be doing it. And when you're playing it, do you have those moments where you just get lost in the sounds that are being created? And ideally, ideally, um, especially for the, the freer stuff. Like I'm always usually applying repertoire or some, some sensibility or something like that. But the sooner you can kind of like get to that point of doing no wrong and knowing when to stop counting on that. Like there's a, there's a cutoff even for like the can do no wrong aspect where you're getting indulgent in the not doing wrong part of it. Um, but it's case by case, I guess. It's really like I, I count on it, but at the same time I try to be prepared for it failing. Yeah, I, 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 get, I get that mentality. Because none of this should work. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> And I, I'm sure there are times when Jason Smeltzer and your and your your theremin contraptions, for lack of a better word, all strung together with wires, are, are become one. Mm. 
that was the hope. I, I was saying how a lot of this is a result of a, the pandemic where I needed some accompaniment and it, it became a nice enough of everything. Like I can live here for a moment but without being fiddly and then play and then control a bit over here and do something with my foot that no one knows I'm doing. And, uh, one big ballet, for lack of a better description. I love it. I love it. And uh, any, any gigs coming up uh, that folks might uh, be able to come out and see? That's storytelling one. Um, where there's a project called The Old Stories, uh, which doesn't emphasize theremin, but of course, it's a big part of it. We're, it's at the Old Brick Theater. Should I do the whole yeah, give, description? Yeah, give the, yeah, sure. Uh, it's The Old Stories at the Old Brick Theater. It'll be the end of July, July 30th, 7.30. And a gentleman by the name of Philip Mosley, who's uh, always always learning something from him. He'll be telling some stories. We'll be doing some Kavka, uh, some Franz Franz Kavka, some weird stuff. Which that's another story, even why we're doing that. One of my fairy tales that someone has illustrated in the last couple of years. A uh, some Italo Calvino. I love Italo. Uh, some of his uh, folklore library. I guess you would describe it. And just so we're not completely dark, uh, we're going to end it with some Lewis Carroll, just for just some, some, some levity. Beautiful. Know. And that's July 30th. July 30th. And this will be here, and there will also be a guitarist friend of mine, Mark Reinhardt. At the Old Brick Theater, the old North Brick Scranton Theater. on Market. You got it. Yeah, right. So check it out, folks, if you want to go. If you're watching this uh, in 2023. <laughs> uh, so are you up for another piece? Yeah, let's do something weird. You want weird, right? Whatever you feel. Jason Smelter, folks, once again. And I'm going to let Jason just play us right out. I think that's the best way to do it. Thanks again for tuning in here on Electric City Television. My name is Lars Pugliese. I hope you enjoyed this installment, and we'll be back again with another one soon. Again, once, once again, Jason Smelter. Before the law, there stands a guard. A man comes from the country begging admittance to the law, but the guard cannot admit him. May he hope to enter at a later time? That is possible, said the guard. The man tries to peer through the entrance. He had been taught that the law was to be accessible to every man. Do not attempt to enter without my permission, says the guard. I am very powerful. Yet, I am the least of all the guards. From hall to hall, door after door, each guard is more powerful than the last. By the guard's permission, 
The man sits by the side of the door, and there he waits. For years, he waits. Everything he has, he gives away in the hope of bribing the guard, who never fails to say to him, I take what you give me only so that you will not feel that you have left something undone. Keeping his watch during the long years, the man has come to know even the fleas on the guards for collar. Growing childish in old age, he begs the fleas to persuade the guard to change his mind and allow him to enter. His sight has dimmed, but in the darkness he perceives a radiance streaming immortally from the door of the law. And now, before he dies, all he's experienced condenses into one question, a question he's never asked. He beckons to the guard, says the guard, you are insatiable, what is it now? Says the man, every man strives to attain the law. How is it then that in all these years, no one else has ever come here seeking admittance? His hearing has failed, so the guard yells into his ear. Nobody else but you could ever have obtained admittance. No one else could enter this door. This door was intended only for you. And now, I'm going to close it. <laughs> 